we all right back there? A little bit? Do you want to bring up the levels here? All right, because I want them to lift too. <laughs> Thank you for all coming. Thank you for taking an interest in survival. Uh, for those of you who haven't read my book, don't know who I am, came here because a cute girl invited you uh, for whatever reason. I remember I was a freshman too at one point. My name is Max Brooks. Uh, yes, I wrote a book called The Zombie Survival Guide. You will find it in the humor section. That was not my decision. <laughs> Because I do not find anything remotely funny about being killed and eaten by zombies. Now, I get asked a lot, uh, why zombies? And my answer is, of course, uh, duh, they're scary. <laughs> but the deeper, more complicated answer is that zombies do not obey the laws of conventional monsters. What I mean by conventional monsters is every other creature out there, you have to go find. All right, let's take a step back and just think about where we are. We are the dominant species on the planet. We have conquered it, we have turned it into one giant Disney world. <coughs> Which means that if you are going to be in contact with a monster, you have to go find it. You have to go to that dark corner of the planet, the, the swamp, or the forest, or the abandoned summer camp. <coughs> And if you do that, if you go looking for trouble, I have no sympathy for you. <laughs> because that is a choice that you make. Now, before most of you were born, there was a very famous man called the Crocodile Hunter. <laughs> <laughs> and people would say that his death, because he was, he was killed, he was killed by a stingray, was a tragedy. No. <laughs> It was an unfortunate occupational hazard, because he chose to do that. He chose to become a crocodile hunter. Nobody drafted him from the Australian Ministry of Crocodile Hunting. He didn't just one day go to his mailbox and get drafted all. Oh, crikey. At some point, probably when he was about your age, he sat down with his career counselor, and he said, you know, I'd like to spend the rest of my life poking dangerous animals with a stick. <laughs> Choice. Yeah. Had he chosen a safer path and become just Steve Irwin, the tax attorney, and he'd been singing at home in his nice, quiet flat in Adelaide or wherever they are in that giant subcontinent of theirs, <laughs> and there had been a knock on the door, and he said, oh, oh, get it. He'd gone to the door door, there had been a stingray, and it jumped on him and stabbed him in the heart, that would have been a tragedy. Because he was minding his own business and trouble came looking for him. And that is what is so scary about zombies, is that you are minding your own business and suddenly they are crashing through your window. And they're not just coming in ones and twos. They're coming in the hundreds, or the thousands, or the millions, or if you live in China and India, in the billions. <laughs> it's a lot of zombies. That is why they are so scary. That is why I'm here. And the first lesson I can impart to you is to disabuse yourself of the misinformation that has been brought to you by conventional zombie media. People say, well, what does that mean? Huh? Well, it means every book, movie, comic, app, <laughs> and video game. And all of those do not care about saving your life, like I do. <laughs> they care about entertaining. Now, is there any creative writing majors here? Anyone? Okay, good. The one guy who's a little ashamed of it. <laughs> he didn't raise his hand too high. He was like, oh, maybe. It's all right. You're not going to make any money off it. So. But what? what's your name? Harold. Harold? Harold. Harold. Yeah. Your parents named you Harold. <laughs> all right. <laughs> You're from this country. Wow. <laughs> As a creative writing major, will tell you that in order to write an interesting story, an entertaining story, right, Harold, one that keeps people interested, you have to build in drama. 
And what I mean by building in drama is you have to make your characters make decisions that might not necessarily be the smartest ones, but they facilitate an interesting story. Let's say Harold wrote a movie in which a group of teenagers went to a summer camp, <laughs> all alone, and they heard something. And they said, I heard something. <laughs> what was it? I don't know. Well, don't go check it out. That's crazy. Listen, everybody, just everyone stay here where we can see each other. Turn on all the lights, lock all the doors and windows, don't, don't leave the room. We're just gonna wait here until the sun comes up. And then when it does, we're all gonna leave the room as one group, we're gonna get in our car, go home. <laughs> now that would be the right thing to do. That would also be a 10 minute movie. <laughs> So, you have to build in drama. Harold has to build in characters that say, I heard something. What was that? I don't know. Hmm. <laughs> Chet, go check it out. <laughs> While Sally and I are going to go in this room and have sex. <laughs> and it facilitates the story. And it's entertaining. But it's not necessarily a good life lesson. <laughs> this is the problem in this country, is that we have this thing in America where we tend to look at entertainment and think, oh, well, that's how I'm supposed to live my life, right? Oh. No. Okay, for those of you, but, right, who here has played Left 4 Dead? Right, good for you. It's fun, it's exciting. No. In the real zombie outbreak, and I was going to disappoint some of you, there's not going to be random weapons and ammo just sort of scattered around. Up and it happens to be the right ammo for the right weapon. And wow, coincidence. <laughs> there's not going to be certain vehicles that you somehow know how to drive, or there's going to be certain characters you meet that happen to give you hints that help you along. And especially, there's not going to be little boxes or bottles or whatever with red crosses on them that you touch them, and then suddenly, bam, you are healed and ready to fight. There is nothing in the world that can do that. There is something that can make you feel that way. No. <laughs> and that's your choice if you want to fight the living dead on crack. But... <laughs> in the real world, survival is very detail-oriented and very, very boring. That's why a lot of conventional entertainment doesn't have the real stuff because it will put you right to sleep and you need to turn the TV off. For example, those of you who have read my book know the most important thing you need in a zombie plague, and those of you who don't are thinking, I'm sure, well, I need a big gun and a cool car and a, a jet pack. <laughs> Someone just said yes. <laughs> yeah, there he goes. Nice hair, by the way. Very grabbable. Anyway. <laughs> Jeff? Yeah. All right, Jeff. Jeff. <laughs> Harold. <laughs> okay, Jeff. The most important thing in a zombie outbreak, <laughs> it's this. Okay? Because, Jeff, you are not going to be shooting every minute or karateing every minute. You are not even going to be jetpacking every minute. But you will be losing fluid every minute of every day. Anybody see the movie 28 Days Later? Right, great movie. I loved it. We all know those zombies. Uh, because there was a scene in 28 Days Later, remember where the insane military commander, and boy, I've never seen that guy in a movie before, um, <laughs> who has a zombie or whatever, the crazo, and he locks him up, and he says, I waited to see how long it takes for the infected to starve to death. Well, if he needs to eat, he needs to drink. And guess what? Four days without water, you're pretty much a goner. So if that were a real movie, then Cillian Murphy, you know, the scarecrow, he'd wake up and he would go wandering around London and there would just be dead bodies everywhere. And the movie would be called Four Days Later. <laughs> so in real life, you need something boring. You need water. And you can't just have this. You need a way to purify more water. Clean water. And I know some of you are like, wait, clean water. I mean, wait a minute, clean 
water. Is that like those commercials that I see late at night on TV about third world countries and my parents feel guilty and turn the channel? Yes! <laughs> exactly! Because guess what? In a zombie outbreak, we become the third world country. And let me tell you something. Um, if you drink out of a puddle, it's not going to be pretty. Because I've never seen, let's say, in a zombie movie, somebody die of dehydration. Because it's boring. You would never put, Harold would never put that in a movie. The studio would make him take it right out. If Harold had a scene and we we're like, come on, we're going to get out of here. Oh my God. Oh my God, such a headache. Oh, I'm so dehydrated. Nothing wrong with that one. You would not put that in. You would also not have a scene where someone drank out of a puddle and crapped themselves to death. <laughs> Harold would never get away with that. Come on, we gotta get out of here. Oh my god. Oh. No studio in the world would let that by. But that's exactly what would happen. So it's boring, but it's important. Now, because this is America, obviously we need to talk about things that are not boring, right? Like weapons. Okay? Yeah. Yay. Specifically guns. Because statistically, there are more guns in this room than there are people. <laughs> so we have to talk about guns. And everyone's like, yeah, because I know Jeff. Jeff is like, oh, yeah. <laughs> this is going to be awesome. All right. Okay. Jeff. <clears throat> Here's the thing about guns. They don't kill people. And I don't care what your uncle says, people don't kill people either. <laughs> Bullets kill people! The bullet is the weapon. Let's just step out of Rambolicious world for a minute and think about this. The bullet is the weapon. The gun is just the launcher. How many bullets can you possibly carry with you? There are 300 million Americans. I don't know how many Mexicans. <laughs> and I'm not being racist. I, no, I, just, I don't know. I literally just don't. I should probably pick up an atlas at some point, but I don't know. There's probably millions of them, though. And there's a hell of a lot more Canadians than they want us to believe. <laughs> so if you put all of them together, even if you took that number and cut it in half, and I know, I promise there would be no math in this lecture, but if you took all the Americans... Mexicans and the snow creatures and put us all together. <laughs> Even if you halved that number, that is more zombies than any amount of ammo you could stuff in your drawers, Jeff. <laughs> so here's the thing. You need a close combat hand weapon. Or for those of you who play World of Warcraft, I will not make you raise your hands. <laughs> you were, oh, one guy who's proud of me. What's your name? What? Pat. Pat. Pat, Pat, you will need a melee weapon. <laughs> now, here's the thing, Pat. The, we the, the melee weapons that I'm sure you have, you know, your, your rapier and your scimitar and your dwarven ball. <laughs> Pat, they're not real. <laughs> All right? Those are display items. I know what you're thinking. You're like, well, no, no, wait a minute. My, my falchion is battle ready. No, it's not. <laughs> it's Renaissance Fair ready. <laughs> now, now, Pat, you got some, Pat's sitting in between, like, two girls. <laughs> nice. Now... <laughs> on their face like, well then why would Pat have these weapons? All right, ladies, here's the thing. Uh, any business majors here for marketing? Okay, yeah. one guy who's, all right, you'll all be working for him. Anyway, um, he, what's your name? AJ. AJ will tell you that there's something called targeted marketing to a certain demographic, okay? Pat is that demographic. Across this country, there are millions of Pats. Some of them are young men. Some of them, unfortunately, are not so young. They're middle-aged, they live with their mothers. Um, but this demographic of Pats, they buy these weapons because they think if, if they can get one of you back to his apartment, which is actually his mother's basement, <laughs> and show you his sword and say, ha ha, Aragorn! <laughs> that somehow that's going to work some magic. It never does, but Pat's not giving up. And that hope has spawned an entire industry of display weaponry. And the problem is, in a real outbreak, 
Sting is not going to hold up against too many zombie necks. Right, Pat? Okay. The good news is, Pat, that these weapons actually do exist out there, but not in weapon form. They're very plentiful, and they're very cheap. You just have to know where to look. Any history majors? All right, two guys. And it's fine. It's not like history's going to repeat itself. Forget them. But what's your name? John and Ryan. John and Ryan will tell you that most weapons were not invented as weapons, right? They were invented as tools. Because they will also tell you something crazy, that wars throughout time have mainly been fought by poor people. Go figure. <laughs> now, unless you have an army that can loan you a weapon, like us or ancient Rome or whoever, most soldiers happen to be peasants working with the tools, this is all they own, and then they get called up to go fight for like a rose or a lady's love or whatever for a knight, and they're like, okay, well, here's my weapon. And that's where weapons came from. Nobody ever invented the battle axe. They invented the axe. And at some point in the fjords of Norway, <laughs> your great, great ancestor, Greg Long, Bjorn Bjornsson, Bjorn was chopping a tree, and Sven Lundergardsson was saying, Bjorn, we have to go on a day to the western shore. <laughs> and Bjorn was like, I don't have a weapon. Oh, all is balls. And Bjorn was like, hey, you're going to hurt somebody with that, Bjorn. And he went, oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> So the moral of this historical story, Pat, is when you're looking for a real weapon, you go to Home Depot. <laughs> you want a sword, you get a machete. You want a battle axe, you get an axe. You want a dwarven ball, you get a sledgehammer. There they are. Not meant for display items, they can take a pounding. So we're set. Weapons. Boom. Vehicles. The next great American icon. At least it used to be. Um, we don't build them anymore. We love to drive them. And I understand. Look, I, I get it. I love it. I think it, I think they're wonderful. I love the yellow Hummer in the movie with the guy from Cheers and he drove all around the country. It was wonderful. Y'all, you guys see um, the new Dawn of the Dead, the one in 04? There's a great scene where they turn an airport shuttle bus into an armored personnel carrier. And it was awesome. Guys, my age or my generation, we could hear the music in our head. Dun, 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 dun. <laughs> Yeah! <laughs> However, how many people in this room are licensed mechanics? None of you. What a shock. Statistically, Monster.com just put that as the number one song for job in America. Yeah. Why? Because it's a complicated piece of machinery. Does anybody know how many parts there are in the internal combustion engine? I don't. <laughs> but I know it just takes one to break. <laughs> So if you're out there with your yellow Hummer, it just takes one little piece of metal, just blink, you're dead. <laughs> and even if you are a licensed mechanic and you know what to do, da, 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 whatever, <laughs> guess what? Guns need bullets, cars need gas. Now, where I'm from, in LA, we all drive hybrids. <laughs> <laughs> Which means we can go twice as far before we run out of juice and die. <laughs> Because the problem is, for all our technical innovation, we have yet to invent a car that runs on fear. <laughs> and until we do, how about a bicycle? It's light, easy to repair, come up against a barricade, pick it up, climb over, done. Not sleek, not sexy, but it does run on fear. <laughs> <laughs> so these are some of the things you will need. And unfortunately, the most important thing you will need is the most anti-American thing in, that I can imagine. And that is working together. <laughs> And I understand, look, we're, very, we're an individualist society. Forget what you see on C-SPAN about, oh, partisan politics. That's, that's, 
the last link of the chain. We are individuals. That's who we are. That's what we love. We are the cult of Rambo. We are the alpha male with the big gun, and we can take care of anything by ourselves. Rambo, right. Rambo, he gets stabbed, sews it up, no problem, and charges himself. Now, I've seen all the Ram one through four. I get to see Rambo five, the battle with testicular cancer. <laughs> because guess what? Not even Rambo is going to take care of that wound by himself. <laughs> so Rambo needs Dr. Schlossman. Dr. Schlossman doesn't know much about an M60. He doesn't know how to hit a Viet Cong with a bow and arrow at 100 yards in high wind. He doesn't know about that stuff. You know what he does know? Ball cancer. <laughs> because he's what's called a specialist. And that's what we do in this country. And that's what we do in this world. That's what we do as a species. That is the reason that we are all in here now, in our artificial cave with our artificial sun, and a saber-toothed cat, and a short-faced bear, and all the other predators that used to just feast on us are in a museum and can suck it. <laughs> because they couldn't specialize, we could. At some point, we got together and said, wow, you're really good at throwing a spear. You'll be the spear thrower. You're really good at making baskets. You're the basket maker. Wow, you told us that that strike of lightning meant that you need virgins. Okay, you're the shaman. There we go. <laughs> we specialize. So when you form your zombie group, you need to start thinking about specialization. What does everybody do well? Which Start asking each other what your majors are. You don't want a bunch of journalism majors all in the same group asking each other what's happening. <laughs> you need to figure it out. Who does what? Now, ladies, there's going to be a lot of men asking you to join their group yes. for no apparent reason. <laughs> And they'll try, no, no, I just have this feeling, like, you, you've got some skills. Yeah, no, you've been really good, like, with the crossbow. I just feel that, yeah. You yeah. my group. Don't. <laughs> Especially if they're freshmen. <laughs> and by the way, freshmen, men, fresh men, fresh boys, if you see a zombie, a, a, a fresh zombie that, like, a week ago was a hot girl, don't. <laughs> <laughs> just don't. <laughs> But that's, you have to start forming your group now. Is this a dry campus? No. Okay. I figured it's Jersey, but you never know. <laughs> you have a great ally, alcohol. Okay, because it's not enough just to figure out who has the right skills, all right? They also have to have the right temperament. Okay, I say if you can't survive a road trip to Jersey, you know, from Vegas, you're not going to survive the apocalypse with these people. Yeah. So what you do is you have to vet them carefully. Because it doesn't matter if you have a pre-med student who the minute it hits the fan goes, Oh my God, we're all going to die! No, you, you start to get to know them slowly, carefully, you know, hang out. And look, I understand. Remember when you were all freshmen and you're all scared and someone was like, was like Oh my God, like, do you like reruns of the Chappelle show? Yeah, I do too. Oh my God, we're totally friends, yeah! And you thought you had a best friend. And then like two weeks later you were like, Wow, you're not really into that hygiene thing, are you? <laughs> and you all break up. Half of you are not friends with the same people you were friends with that first week of orientation. Well, start orienting. Start vetting. Get them drunk. <laughs> Put on some socially controversial movies. <laughs> and if halfway through they say things like, well, I mean, I can see Ike's point of view. Tina was kind of asking for it. And you know. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I don't want them in my group. <laughs> Get to know them. And this is really important. And look, and this is, I know some, uh, you also have another great advantage on college campuses. Uh, jocks. No, 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 this is important. Are there any here? Any guys who play sports, you know, voluntarily? One guy in the back. What's your name? Pat. Pat? There's <laughs> <laughs> no mistake in YouTube. Um, but listen, no, this is the Pat stand up. Let them let them take a look at this specimen. All right, Pat, what sport do you play, Pat? You're a rock climber. Right, yeah, he climbs a rock. 
So, no, but this is important. Because not only does Pat have agility and strength, Pat has something most of us nerdbags have never heard of called male pride. <laughs> and that, no, that's really important. That male pride, it drives Pat to defy gravity for no reason. <laughs> he climbs up a rock, guess what? You gotta climb right back down again. It's a freaking point. <laughs> Seriously, what? What? The like the Sports Illustrated naked model up there? No. You go up there and you. Oh. <laughs> but that's why he does it. Look what I've done. I am Pat. <laughs> Male pride. Because let me tell you something. There's going to be situations when you are going to need a suicide mission. <laughs> And so what you're gonna have is that pat and that pat. All right, they're both gonna be standing there. And they're like, man, we're gonna cross a quad. We need to get in the tool shed. Call the zombies. And that, that pat is gonna say to that pat, he's gonna be like, yeah, pat, man, wish we had a real man to go do that. <laughs> man, I guess, I guess we don't, you know. And that pat is gonna be like, step aside. <laughs> Where's my climbing gear? There was a time in our history called the 19th century. The 19th century was a time when white men went to go discover places where people already lived. But it wasn't enough to just discover them. It was to discover them their way. Okay? They couldn't go to the heart of Africa and look at African people and say, wow, look at how they're dressing and how they're living. They've found a way to live in this environment. No, they had to do it the English way and this and English. Here they were, and yes, yes, and the 46 porters with the tea set. Yes, and there, here we are. Look at these poor natures. <laughs> and then they were done. <laughs> and the 19th century is paved on a road of dead white men who had to do it their way. So don't do it your way, because unfortunately, every now and then you have a throwback to the 19th century. I don't know if any of you have read the book or seen the movie Into the Wild. Uh, well, for those of you who haven't, it's the story of an asshole who goes in the wilderness and dies. <laughs> That's it. I've just told you the entire story. Because he was like you. He was young and idealistic, and he was going to take on the world. And the world said, no, you won't. <laughs> There's a scene where he's asking life advice from Vince Vaughn, because, you know, who wouldn't? Um, and they're talking about this horrible word, society. I want to get away from society, and it just gets more horrible and disgusting, and it, it takes on, it's almost like they're saying anal word, society. <laughs> Forgetting the fact that the reason we invented society was not so we could Facebook, it was so we could get the hell out of the wilderness. Because the wilderness is violent and brutal and will kill you. So therefore, if you're going to the Sahara or Svalbard, you better go there first and figure out how to live there. And by the way, don't think of just going north. Because on Z-Day, the maple leaf curtain is going to slam shut. <laughs> and those vicious, subhuman killing machines that we call Canadians... <laughs> are going to be waiting for you with a Molson and a sharpened hockey stick. <laughs> because what we call the great zombie plague, they call the great payback. <laughs> so these are some of the things you are going to need to know in surviving a zombie apocalypse. Now, rather than me just continue to talk, I think it's more important to take your questions to figure out what is on your mind on how to survive a zombie pandemic. So who's going to be the first to overcome their social anxiety disorder? <laughs> Bring the house lights up. There we go. Yes, miss. What do you think of um, The Walking Dead? Oh, my God, Walking Dead. I saw that first first season, and I was like, oh, my God, this is so good. It's so amazing, and I'm loving it. I'm going to be addicted to this show forever. Oh, my God. And then they fired Darabont. They can kiss my ass. <laughs> I'm sorry, Frank. Darabont's an actual friend of mine. So, <laughs> Oh, well. No, it's actually a true story. I was, I was walking on the beach and I heard, Max, 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 and I looked, and it was a guy yelling at his dog. <laughs> he was chasing my dog, and I looked, and I was saying to my wife, that's Frank Darabont. And we'd been emailing, but we never, he didn't know what I looked like. And I was like, oh my God, because I thought, I, 
it's Malibu, so I thought it was like two gay guys. <laughs> and no, there's anything wrong with that. I thought there was an old gay guy, a young gay guy, and I'm like, oh no, that's Frank Darabont and Thomas Jane, oh my god. So I'm like, hey, Frank, oh, Max, oh, that's so cool, yeah, hey, hey Max, I'm, I'm, I'm having a barbecue, you want to come over? And of course, my instinct is like, no, thanks. I'm always like, could you go to Very cool guy. The man gave us Shawshank, for crying out loud. And he gave us the greatest freaking zombie TV show ever. And so to reward him, they fired him. So, moving on. Yes? Where would you go? Where would I go? What's your name? Ed. Ed? Ed. 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 Where would I go? Ed has just asked, where would I go in the zombie outbreak? That is a great question. Next question. <laughs> she asked, what if they're like running zombies or superheroes? Those aren't real. <laughs> Moving on. Yes, sir. Oh, I always ask that question. How many people? All right. Um, figure out, first of all, figure out what your skill sets are, what you need. For example, like, if you're going to a desert, you don't need the igloo builder. <laughs> you would need him in the Arctic. So figure out what your skill set are, and then figure out redundancy. Because you can't just have one dude. You can't have, like, if you are going to the Arctic, you can just have one igloo builder. You need an igloo builder and an assistant igloo builder. All right, so you need that group. It needs to be large enough that there is redundancy, but small enough that you can keep order, all right? Because you all need to work together. Because if you're stopping, I mean, look, I was in college. I know what student groups are like. You're this close to figuring something out. And somebody raises their hand and is like, ah, I just feel that the transgender community has not been represented here. <laughs> We're talking about what pizza to order. <laughs> Figure it out now. Anyone else? Oh yes, in the back, yes. Um, which sport do you think uh, produces the best athletes to uh, survive in a uh, zombie outbreak? Oh, that's an excellent question. No, I've said that. The, the ones that produce the ones that get the most injuries. All right, because you don't want, look, you don't want a sport where a guy is thinking all the time because he may think, I don't want to do this. <laughs> All right? I, can't, I don't know how many pro tennis players I've seen go like that. Because it's self-preservation. Football players, man, they're, yeah, rugby, hawker. <laughs> I high school, that was a sport. <laughs> somebody that does not care and is like, I just want to smash something. <laughs> because, like I said, there is going to be a time when you need Hulk smash. <laughs> Anyone else? A question. I'm going to get this gentleman and then we'll do questions. Not yet! Hold it! Yes. Would you recommend a sharp or a blunt weapon? Sharp or blunt? I always get asked this question. Which do you have more experience with? Well, then go blunt. You don't want to have to relearn sharp. If you're used to smashing people in the face with a blunt object. <laughs> Incidentally, what's your name? Adam. Stand up, Adam. See, we're vetting now. Adam's skill, smashing people in the face with a blunt object. <laughs> what's that? Ruel. Ruel? Ruel. Ruel. All right. We're building your group here. Face smash it with blunt. Now, yes, go. How good do you think World Wars, uh, the movie World War Z is going to be? How good? Okay, see, look, you're asking an inside question. Those people don't understand. Um, a, a while back, I wrote a book called World War Z. And if you're English, World War Z. And it was about a zombie outbreak all around the world. And before it even came out, a gentleman named Brad Pitt said, I want the movie rights. And I said, uh, yes. <laughs> Now, here's the thing. I grew up in Hollywood, so I knew the risk I was taking. Like, if I was coming from, like, Kentucky, I would have been like, oh my god, this is awesome, Hollywood's gonna make a movie. <laughs> I knew what I was getting into. And I knew that rule one of Hollywood is to take the book writer out of the picture. And I knew that, and it was a risk. But a wise man once said, risk is our business. 
Can anyone here tell me who said that? You were the most pathetic wannabe nerds I've ever seen. That wise man was Captain Kirk. And Captain Kirk said, risk is our business. I have lived by that. So I was like, yes, Mr. Pitt, good luck. So I was not involved. I still have not been involved. Now, along the line, they got a writer, and they brought in another writer, and then they got a director, Mark Forster, and he did The Kite Runner and, and a bunch of other great art films and a Bond movie. But so they're making the movie now. I have visited the set. I wish I could tell you more, simply because I didn't get a chance to see much, because the movie is so freaking big that it took hours to set up every shot. So literally, I flew all out to Scotland with my family, and I'm on the set, and hours are set up, and they're like, action! And I basically saw what would be about three seconds of the movie. And it's Brad Pitt running through a whole crowd, and everybody's running, and it could have been called Sail at Pennies. And that's all I saw. <laughs> How good do I think the movie's going to be? I have no idea. I'm going to reserve judge. I know it's going to sound crazy because we're supposed to all judge things. I know. I look on the interwebs. Um, <laughs> I'm going to reserve judgment until the movie actually comes out. So when all of you go see it, hopefully, halfway through the movie, you might hear a voice in the audience that says, wow, this is pretty good. Or you might hear someone say, what the hell is this crap? <laughs> that may be me. <laughs> we shall see. Anyone else? Yes? Should you avoid the cities? Should you avoid the cities? I think it depends what city we're talking about. Now, I have lived and worked in New York. I was there on 9-11. I was there in the blackout. New York will survive anything anybody can throw at it. I live in LA now. No. It's my hometown. I love it. We're gone. <laughs> Anyone else? Um, back. Yes, in the back. Is there any college classes that you would consider exceptionally useful for surviving a zombie apocalypse? Oh, like, that's, that's an excellent question. Um, well, I was just discussing any, something with your students. Uh, any course where they make you re read primary material and nothing from other professors. Okay, because what I've discovered, you're all in college, and you all read you know, stuff that's written by professors for other professors, and just for them, and there's a word for that, and if you do that word too much, you will go blind. <laughs> I would think about things that are useful, things that you might actually have to work with, and build, and make. There was a class that I don't think they teach anymore, maybe at some high schools, it's called SHOP. You actually have to build something, maybe that. But more importantly, think about the skills that some of you already have that can be converted to emergency survival. Because look, in all of your dorms, there's at least one guy who's growing his own weed. <laughs> there's your farmer. <laughs> Anybody else? Yes, sir. Uh, what influenced you to write like World War Z? Like, what kind of zombie things did you watch when you were like? Oh, our what age? influence? Well, I, I hate to say this, but um, I had only one, <coughs> and that's all I needed. It was a man named George A. Romero. <laughs> all praise be unto him, <laughs> because George, it's his world, and we're just living in it. And George, and I can say George. I've met him six times. Yeah, George. Well, George created, not, well, I don't say created. There were zombie movies before George Romero, but there were also space movies before George Lucas. He redefined the genre. He gave us the flesh-eating whore. So all I needed was that. And then from that, that was just my little catalyst. And I took off. And I was like, okay. Because when I wrote World War Z, I wanted to answer my own questions. Because look, every other zombie story that I had read up until that point or seen or whatever was all micro stories. It was all like one person or one individual, one group, and sort of their adventures, like Saving Private Ryan, but with zombies. <laughs> but look, you know when you go see a movie and there's always some nerd bag in your group who won't let you enjoy the movie? Because it was like, well, that would never happen. And then he's trying to tell you about reality. Or he's like, well, what's happening in other places? And he's asking questions and you're like, dude, shut up. <laughs> well, that nerd is me. I have a lot of questions. So I wanted to write a zombie story to answer my own questions. What are other countries doing? What are other walks of life doing? 
you know, every zombie story, they're always like, yeah, I heard on the radio the government said blah. Well, what about the government? So I have the government. What about the army? I have the army. How do you feed 100 million refugees? I tried to figure that out. So I took real life because guess what? I was a history major. And it is useful. <laughs> Because there's nothing that zombies can do to us that we haven't done to each other. And I learned a lot from human history. It's a great way to figure out how we got here. Uh, so my influence was George Romero, but it was also a man named Studs Terkel, who wrote a book called The Good War, Oral History of World War II. Every country, every battle, every walk of life. Wow, it's the first time I realized World War II was a world war. Duh. <laughs> so lots of those influences. Anyone else? Yes, Red. When you do have to use a gun, what's the best kind of gun to use? Oh, what's the best kind of gun? The one kind of works? <laughs> no, I mean, seriously, because, you know, in America, everything has to be all tricked out. Laser sight, guess what? Laser sight needs batteries. How many batteries are you going to carry? You know? Uh, I'm sure you've heard of a weapon called the M16. Unhear of it. You want a gun that's not going to crap out on you? You want a gun that hopefully the ammo will not be too big so you can carry a lot. Guess what? You also want one that's illegal. Because you don't want to have, all right, your your tricked out squad automatic weapon in your car and a cop stops you on day one of a zombie outbreak. Because guess what? Sometimes the government, they're the last to know. So he doesn't know it's a zombie outbreak. He just sees you with your saw and you're like, officer, zombies. <laughs> Anyone else? Yes? Uh, what would you grab? What would I grab? Yeah. Uh, it's, if I had all the time in the world, yeah. I would have a really good machete. Because it's light, it's easy to use, and it was designed for a dumbass like me. <laughs> okay, this is the problem with specialized weapons. Everyone's like, oh, we're going to get a samurai sword. Guess what? A samurai sword is meant to be used by a samurai. <laughs> And a samurai does nothing all day but just samurai business. <laughs> I don't do that. I've watched Kill Bill. That's as far as it goes with me. So I would grab a really good full tank Ontario. Yeah, I go a little far into this. But an old-fashioned full tank Ontario machete without a saw back. That's what I would use. That and a good pair of walking shoes. No, because that's true. These little details. People, you don't want to use your brand new hiking boots on day one. Because has any, anyone here ever hiked? Let me tell you something. First day of hiking with brand new hiking boots, you will tear the crap out of your shoes and your feet. And you will have blisters and you will not be able to walk and you will be zombie chow. Anyone else? Question in the back. Hello, how are you? I'm very well, thank you. How about yourself? Uh, this is my friend's question, but um, he's too afraid to show his face right now. That's okay. <laughs> he's... His question is that if you're caught in a zombie chase and all of a sudden you have diarrhea, what would you do? <laughs> That's a very interesting question and very apropos that your friend was too afraid. <laughs> yup. What's his name? <laughs> what? Can I not mention that? He will not talk to me again. All right. Well, listen, scared friend. Greg. If, let me just tell you my person. If I was trapped in a zombie plague and I'm running for my life, diarrhea would be the last of my worries. Unless it was like fatal Giardia diarrhea. What if it's just like a bad chimichanga diarrhea? <laughs> You, Greg, you're a lucky man if you live long enough to change your shorts. <laughs> Moving on. Yes. What would I bring? Well, it depends on where I'm going. For example, I would not need mosquito netting in the Arctic. You know, I would probably need uh, a good canteen if I was in the desert. You have it's all environmental specific. You got to think about where I'm going, okay? So therefore, that goes to your skill set, all right? You, if you're going through a forest, you need someone who knows like, oh, this mushroom is good, this mushroom will kill you. This one will let you talk to Jimi Hendrix. <laughs> Anyone else? Yes, sir. Can you the zombie How quickly do you think that 
that. <laughs> oh, you mean, okay, he, that's a good question. How long before society just implodes? That's an excellent question. I have absolutely no idea because I think it depends on where you are. It depends on your country. For example, uh, I, like I said, I've lived in a city that knows how to get back up on its feet in a heartbeat. I've had friends who lived in another city, a southern city, which taught me the lesson that if you're standing on your roof with a sign that says, please help, and Air Force One just flies on over, that could take several days. So plan for the maximum. It doesn't matter where you are. Don't just be like, no, we're fine. We're fine. It's all right. We're not going to bring the power back on. Because you may end up eating puppy chow. <laughs> Anyone else? Question here. Well, is, there anything, thank you. is there anything that terrifies you other than zombies, and what are you working on now? Oh, God. Yeah, well, that's two different questions. What I'm working on now, well, I'm working on three things. I'm working on, uh, I wrote a short story called The Extinction Parade, uh, which is about a zombie outbreak told from the point of view of vampires. <laughs> and it's sort of like an inconvenient truth. <laughs> because initially they think it's awesome, and they're like, oh my god, this is great, society's breaking down, we can kill anyone we want, anywhere we want, wow. And then eventually they're like, wait a minute, what are we going to feed on? <laughs> uh, so that's what I'm working on. Um, it's becoming a comic book series now, limited, just limited series. I'm also working on uh, a graphic novel, uh, which is a true story from the First World War, nothing to do with zombies. And then I'm working on a book, which is so different than anything I've ever done, I'll probably publish it under an assumed name. Because I don't want people who like love my zombie stuff, you know, looking on Amazon and ordering it and being like, what the hell is this crap? <laughs> no, because that's true. Look, if any of you become published authors, um, it doesn't matter why people buy your stuff, even if they don't understand what they're buying and it's their fault, they'll give you a bad review anyway. So, uh, assume names, whatever. John Johnson. Um, as far as what else scares me, well, given the fact that I'm a parent, I have a six-year-old kid, how about the nightmare of visiting him in rehab in 20 years and him going, this is your fault! <laughs> <laughs> Moving on. <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, really question there, who's publishing graphic novels, and second question of what value do you put on uh, canned foods for preservation? Okay, uh, who's publishing the graphic novel? Avatar and Random House. And what value do I put on canned foods? Uh, a lot. I mean, I, I, it depends though. If you're stocked up, if you're, if you're holed up in your zombie fort, that's where canned foods are actually better than dried foods because canned foods have their own water in it. So that's always good. But on the road, canned foods are heavier and you're gonna sweat a lot more. So I would go with dry foods more. That, I would do the dry foods, that's better for you. It all depends. Do you have a preference, like a Slim Jim, or whether it's... I'm just saying, you know. But, you know, and that's another thing. Look, you know, when you're when you're packing, pack food you want to eat. Because this is important. No, you know, like, you know, some people, they have these emergency rations. Because I live in L.A., we all have earthquake kits, and, like, you go to people's homes, and they have these emergency food, and I'm like, you would never eat this. And they're like, well, if I'm hungry enough, I'm like, yeah, if you're hungry enough, you would freaking eat your dog. But, <laughs> moving on. We have a question in the back. Question in the back. Don't say you're answering for a friend who's too scared. I'm not. It's okay. Oh, good for you. Okay. Um, I was just wondering, while you were writing World War Z, where did you get the inspiration for your characters? Where did I get the inspiration for my characters? Some of them were from real life, obviously. I mean, I'm, if you've read World War Z, you know that there are certain characters who are actually real people who I've thinly disguised. <laughs> uh, some of them come from history. Like I said, I'm a history buff. I'm a buff in history. I was a history major, and I love history. And I said, oh, this person would work. Uh, so that, I mean, and most importantly, when you're a writer, you don't choose your story, your story chooses you. I don't know if that makes sense. Who's the wig? Who's the one creative writing major here? Okay. Right, Harold. That, Harold. <laughs> <laughs> Ask Harold. Look, Harold will tell you. Harold doesn't choose his stories. They say to him, they come out of the ether, and they're like, Harold, you need to write me. Okay, you need to write about the sword of ice, wind, fire. And he's like, yes, you're right. The sword, once there was a flummet, and his name, and that's how Harold rolls. That's how most of us do. We don't choose it, it just sort of comes to us. And we're like, oh my god, I have to write about this. Okay, wait a minute. Moving on. Yes. Yeah, you. Oh, no, that's a good question. Uh, will animals become zombies? Who here has a favorite pet? All right, a, a cat or a dog or a hamster. Good news. 
they will not become zombified. They will just die. <laughs> Anyone else? We have a question here. Question here. What scares you more, a zombie attack or a vampire attack? <laughs> well, let's see. A roving, brainless horde that has no other mission in life than tearing me limb from limb and devouring my flesh while I scream for mercy, or a sparkly dude. <laughs> the main warning signs of a zombie attack? When our government starts working together. <laughs> We must be in trouble. What are they not telling us? Yes? What about going to a Twinkie factory? <laughs> what about it? <laughs> Do they really not expire? <laughs> okay. What, wait, no, don't sit down. What's your name? Ralph. Okay. You? Face Smasher? Twinkie Secure. <laughs> In your group, he will be like, all right, give me a face. And he'll be like, dude, look at these Twinkies. <laughs> and he'll be like, we need to eat those. He'll be like, no, we need to watch them for 21 years and see what happens. <laughs> yes? What's your um, policy on kids? Uh, as many as you can support in college? I don't know, what do you mean? <laughs> Having them? From building a team, if someone has a kid or something, like, how do you, you can't okay. tell them, like, you can't do you, do you have a child? No, but my mechanic has a child. Okay. Well, that, this is, look, this is a problem you're going to have to deal with. None of you, how many of you have children? <laughs> One, okay. You and me, we get it. <laughs> they don't get it. Our lives are over. <laughs> we understand what they can do to us. They all think, oh, they're so cute. Um, I think you'll agree with me. And what's your name? Right. Right. I think we agree that I think we should segregate groups. Those with children, those without. Okay? Because those of us with children, and you'll see the different groups. You know, even before you see the kid, those without kids will be like this. <laughs> Those of us with kids, <sighs> come on. <sighs> I know. Come on. Which, incidentally, I'm sorry, you can all talk amongst yourself. When, when did they stop letting us hitting them? <laughs> because our parents, they, our parents didn't even hit us. They just threatened. They're, I'll get the belt. We can't even threaten anymore. Now we all sound like Kevin from The Office. I don't want you doing that because when you do that, you hurt their feelings very much. <laughs> Moving on. How soon before we get to start repopulating? <laughs> Ladies, <laughs> that Mike Ness looking dude over there, I really want you to join my zombie. <laughs> Thank you for making that point. Yes. So, what would be your preferred like preparedness strategy in case you were like trapped inside of the house when zombies come rolling through? You mean like other than like food and water and a toilet? <laughs> That depends on the building. First of all, I would not never camp out on the first floor. You go up the stairs and you destroy the stairs. Look, do you guys ever see the movie um, Night of the Living Dead? This is George Romero's first movie. Well, the, the whole movie revolves around this debate, okay, of the two teams. And one is like, we gotta get in the basement. The other one's like, we're staying right here on the ground floor. No, we got in your basement and the ground floor. And there's this two, and there's Bush and Gore fighting. And I was like Nader watching it, and I was like, get up the goddamn stairs! But they didn't listen to me. So they all died. So that's my philosophy, all right? Get up the stairs. Anyone else? Yes, sir. Do you think that there's any specific country or group of people that are like more trained for an apocalypse than the rest of us? 
Well, I wrote about that in, in World War Z. I mean, there's certain countries do better than others. I think actually we do fine. Because here's the thing about America, and those of you who've studied history will tell you, all two of you, um, we're always the last to the party, but we're always the one to clean up. Yeah. All right, no, it's true. Like, like we're, we always get sucker punched because we're Americans and we have two oceans and you know, harmless snow bunnies above us and we're fine. That's cool. You know, life is awesome and we're just like, oh, when are some friends reruns on? And that's it. And meanwhile, the world is in flames. So we always get sucker punched, you know. But man, when we decide to come back, we come back. Japan bombs Pearl Harbor, we freaking nuke them. <laughs> Russia puts up Sputnik with a little tennis ball that goes doo doo doo. Bam! We put a dude on the moon. Osama bin Laden attacks us, we shot him in the fucking face. <laughs> stages of a zombie apocalypse are not going to be pretty for America, but we will come back. And that's important for you guys. You guys are all going to need to know to keep your heads down in that early phase. Because the early phase will not be fun, because we have another important resource in this country, hillbillies. <laughs> and they can't wait for the zombie apocalypse, okay, because it's like, I finally get to shoot someone in the fight. <laughs> So, like, the first few weeks of a zombie apocalypse, the trailer parks of America will explode <laughs> in a cloud of meth. And, <laughs> and the Ted Nugent music will be blasting, and they will shoot anything they see. We have a question here. A question here, yes. Uh, if one of your friends was dead weight, would you get rid of him? Oh, my God. <laughs> I, no, no, I said, oh my God, because I always get asked that question, never by a girl. <laughs> well, that's interesting. I'm going to have to do a socioeconomic paper about that. No, because it's true, because usually it's a dude. Usually it's just like, it's like this guy is like, yeah, so like, if like one of your friends is dead weight, can you like cut his ankle and like make him be what you get away? And I always make them stand up. So stand up. Okay, dude. <laughs> nope, stand, what's your name? Yes. Yeah. Yes? She will leave you. <laughs> she will say to him, smash him in the face. <laughs> and she will take your Twinkies and she will go. <laughs> now you can sit down. How are we doing on time? Two more questions. Two more questions. Okay, yes. Do you think it's hard to have close friends in your group or is that too emotional? Like Oh, I, no, 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 that's actually, it's a, I've never been asked that. No, because I understand, because if like, let's say, you know, you do, she does leave someone behind. And let's say it's not a close friend, you're like, well, I didn't really know that well. But if it's, you know, if it's that moment when you do, you're like Ricky Schroeder, you're crying, you're like, no, I can't leave you. Um, I would say that personal bonds tend to be a good thing, because you might not get left behind. <laughs> See, that's different. See, like, she's planning to leave behind a stranger. You know, she wouldn't leave behind a friend, like a good friend, because, and this is actually the history majors will tell you, there's this thing about shame and a social group. Like, we had this thing called the Civil War. And the army was very smart, the Northern Army. What they did was they used to draft people from the same town, and they used to all keep them together, because that way you could never run, because you could never go home again. See what I mean? Like, if you put everybody in a different group where everybody's a stranger, you take off. And then you come back home, they're like, how was the war? And you're like, oh man, I killed 50 revs in the rock, yeah. <laughs> so a group will have a group dynamic. I would definitely stay together. Are these your friends? Yeah. Okay, so all of you will stick with J Julie Delpy. Anyway, um, <laughs> one more question. We have a question here? We have a question here, yes. Muammar Gaddafi was supposedly killed this morning until CNN just updated their headline that he was actually a zombie the whole time. How do you see the Libyan government changing? <laughs> policy of shooting people in the face. I think that would work for zombies quite well. All right, one last question, then we're going to wrap it up. Yeah, in the back with the two hands. Sporto, yeah. Third, it's 
start it in China. <laughs> Dude, everything that you're wearing comes from that third world. It's not, it was like, it was a rural area. Um, yeah, and then it spread to, you know, okay, yeah, third world countries in this world. Okay, right. Um, what do you, do you think it would have like reached that extent if it started in like a first world country, like a suburb here? Oh, right, because like in China, they don't have like cell phones. <laughs> I mean, that rural area hardly is, I mean, I would imagine that rural area doesn't have like Dude, a Dude, have you heard of Alabama? <laughs> there are parts of this country where Chinese from the Ming Dynasty would not want to live. <laughs> Yeah, no, because in this country, whenever there's a threat or a problem, man, we just, yeah, all right. Because, right, right, we said, remember? New Orleans, they knew about water. <laughs> and they just, they got rid of that, no problem. No, dude, it doesn't matter, because they're Chinese or American, they're still people. And guess what? People are very, 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 very flawed. And I understand, you all don't know that. You know, you're in college, things are great. You have decent grades, 500 Facebook friends, what's wrong with the world? No problem. Wait. Yeah. Believe me, there's a reason they call my generation the cynical Gen Xers. <coughs> and incidentally, don't take any of us in your zombie group. We'll just moan about Kurt Cobain. <laughs> <laughs> now wrapping up, I need a volunteer from the audience. And fortunately, uh, there are some zombies here. I would like to bring them all up. All of you, all of you who are, who are made up like zombies, come on up. Come on up, don't be shy, zombies. Come on over here. All right, now, all these, uh, get in here, get in a group. Now, I'm gonna teach you all a zombie self-defense move that is going to save your life. And I can do it on all four of them. <laughs> and when I say go, you're all, I like this, you're all going to, because we all know that's the way he's When I say go, you're going to come at me, all right? But all line up, here we go. I know you're all doing that. You all probably took theater classes. Okay. When I say go, are you all ready? 